All right. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's lecture. Today, we're going to talk about perspective projection. So this is uh, not part of the midterm exam, but it is very related to the fifth lecture, which is the last one covered by the midterm exam about uh, matrix transformation. So it is actually a quite a good preparation. A lot of what we talk about today is actually basically applying what we talked about in the fifth lecture, which is, of course, the stuff you should know then by Friday for the midterm exam. Good. So we're talking about uh, perspective projection, that is about the process of bringing a 3D image onto a 2D screen. Now, of course, there are different ways to do this. In graphics, we very often deal with linear perspective, which is defined by transforming a straight line from the scene into a straight line on the image. That is in contrast to other forms of perspective uh, of pro uh, projection. For example, um, the extreme case is probably fish eye view um, perspective. So if you have a camera with a fish eye lens, you get an image that also looks natural, but kind of unrealistic because the perspective is distorted. But with linear perspective, you preserve linear lines. You transform them into straight lines also on the 2D image. So that is why they look more realistic. And then, of course, we can also distinguish between different kinds of linear perspective, most importantly, between parallel uh, projection and perspective projection. The, uh, the difference between this should become clear immediately when you look at these two images. On the left side, we have parallel projection, where you see that all the lines in the image, that uh, no, all the lines that were parallel in the original image are also parallel in the projected image, whereas on the right side you see that there is some uh, changes here because we are considering the perspective of the projection or the perspective of the observer of that scene. So uh, this should be intuitively clear, but let's look into how we can formalize this. Um, for the parallel projection, we say that we project all the objects onto an image plane by a certain projection direction, which is parallel to the viewing direction. So if we have here an image plane, then we project everything in the direction or in a direction that is perpendicular to the image plane. And that way we end up, of course, get, getting images like we have it here on the left side. Also, of course, the image plane can be placed anywhere and then we project in this direction. There is a further distinguishing, distinguish, uh, distinction between uh, so-called orthographic and oblique projection. Oblique projection is when the image plane is not perpendicular to the viewing direction like we have it here in these cases. So this is a case that we will not cover here and that is rather uncommon, but it is uh, mentioned also in the book, which is why, why I put it here, just to so you heard, heard the term once. But we will we'll be dealing basically with so-called orthographic projection. And as I said, the characteristics of this is that it keeps the lines that are parallel in the original scene also parallel in the projected scene. And it preserves, therefore, also the size and the shape of the these planar objects. But for example, if you look here, here you see that this cube is still, uh, 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 this square, the front side of the cube, is still a square, whereas here it is not really a square, but we intuitively think, okay, this is clear that this is a cube and that this was originally a square, although in the image it doesn't look like a square. And that's because we, when we look at a scene in nature, we know that the perspective is a little, that because of our perspective, the relation between the lines changes a little bit. And this is what we want to do with this perspective projection, which is mathematically defined in not that we project everything towards a viewing direction, but we pr project uh, everything towards a viewpoint, which of course in real life the point is our eyes. Or in graphics or when we do the modeling, we speak of a camera position as the viewing point. So we model the scene from a camera position and then we still have of course an image plane and we project towards that image plane but not in a, uh, in a fixed viewing direction but in a viewing direction towards the viewpoint which means of course that we have different projection lines here for these points here which all come together at this 
single viewing point, which is then our virtual camera. And that way we get these effects that it looks more realistic, like in real life, if an object is further away, it looks smaller. So for example, if I hold my hand up here, I cannot see a lot of you sitting in the back, although of course you are all bigger than my hand, but that is because my hand is closer to me, so it appears larger real, um, uh, compared to you when uh, you sit there in the back. Good. All right, so the, 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 that's uh, one of the two, two ma th these are the two major projections that we're dealing with in graphics. Of course, if we want to create a realistic image, like in a virtual reality or in gaming, then we use perspective projection because it creates more natural images. But also parallel projection is quite useful, can be quite useful in general in all kinds of situations where the exact length of an object is very important or is probably more important than having a realistic image, which is, for example, sometimes an architectural or mechanical drawing or play, uh, pl uh, a plan of something, uh, a technical drawing, then uh, <clears throat> you sometimes also use parallel projection in graphics. Um, the other reason why we use parallel pr projection in graphics is that we can uh, use it uh, when we do the perspective projection, as we will see later. So the question we want to deal with today is basically how do we get, how do we get this, how we do this, how do we make a perspectively correct projection of 3D objects onto a 2D screen, like you see here in the right image. And uh, of course, you have already done this in the practicals because you already created 2D images of 3D objects, but you didn't really need to bother about how it works because the API did it, did most of it for you. But of course, it is always um, uh, important and helpful to also not just know how to call a function that does it, but also know how this function works, especially if you have a bug in your, project, in your program and it, the result doesn't look like you want it to look, then of course it very often helps to know what's going on behind it because that also helps you very often to find the bug in your program. And of course, like I said, it's a, a good opportunity because uh, to repeat the stuff that we uh, learned before and that you need for the exam, for the midterm exam, because like I said, a lot of the things that we do today builds on what we talked about in the fifth lecture. Good. So, um, yeah. So the, uh, the major question is how do we go from this 3D description of our virtual world, which is also sometimes called the, the we uh, also sometimes speak of it as the world space. How do we transform this into a 2D image, which is sometimes then called the screen or the image space? Be careful with these uh, terminologies. I'm usually trying to stay as close as possible to the book. Um, but uh, of course, there are other naming conventions exist. So if you implement it with an API, they might use slightly different uh, phrasing here. But so it's, it's important that you understand the concepts behind it. Good. And uh, yeah, like, uh, like I said already, this is related to the fifth lecture, which was about matrix transform, uh, uh, vector transformation with matrices. So you can imagine that we will be doing this with matrices, with matrix multiplication. And since this is a rather complex process, you can also imagine that we will solve this problem by splitting it into single sub-steps that can be more easily done with matrix transformations. And we'll actually see that some of them are really pretty straightforward. Like I said, we have already discussed a lot of the things that we will need today. There is only very few things that are really new today. Good. So uh, let's start with some uh, terminology of what we are uh, what we are going to use. So as I said, we start with a world space where we create our model. So we describe a world space like, a, uh, like usual in a three -dimensional, with a three-dimensional coordinate, coordinate system. We have x, we have y, we have a set coordinate. So this notation, I think I used it before, but I'm not sure if I explained it. This uh, circle with a dot in the middle, that basically means that the y-axis is pointing out of the screen or the, the wall here. Um, the uh, denotation about this, or if it would be pointing inside of it, then you would use this sign here. The idea behind this, or the intuitive reason behind this, is that if you think about an arrow like this, then if you look at it from the back or from the top, this is uh, about what you would see. Good, yeah, so uh, this is just for, for simplification. Of course, I have drawn a, a 2D image here. So we have 
or coordinate system and we can describe our scene which in this case just has two triangles and then we want to create an image or to the image of the scene so we have to decide on from which perspective we want to see that and we do this by placing our viewpoint our camera position somewhere in that world in that world space and we uh, and then we want to do the, the perspective and we have to do the perspective projection towards the image plane which is then indirectly defined by the camera and for that to describe the camera position in the 3d world we use a so-called i vector e so as you see it's the virtual viewpoint which is sometimes called virtual camera sometimes the eye of the observer because that's where we assume that the observer will, looking, will be looking at our computer screen and uh, then but then we only know the position of the camera in the 3D world but we also need to point the camera somewhere and we describe this mathematically by a so-called gaze vector g which is of course a vector pointing straight towards the image plane and the image plane then also specifies indirectly the remaining parameters that we need because of course with the camera we don't have a 360 degree view like we would have with a, a, a fish eye lens but we only see a certain part of it which will then be our our computer screen so we define an image plane and the width and the height of the image plane and also the distance of the image plane from the camera specify this area here that we can see which is sometimes also called the field of view so with that we specify indirectly how much of the scene we are seeing and what we are going to project onto our 2d image and um, <coughs> then we call the borders of this here the uh, the right side the right plane the left plane and also where if we have 3d we have of course a top and a bottom plane defined by the height of the of the image so uh, <coughs> and of course in 3d then we have a plane like here in 2d it's a left and a right line but in 3d of course it would be a plane that describes the space that we are going to see in our final image and also in graphics we are also restricting that str that range by the so-called near and far plane this has uh, first of all practical reasons of course if we're too close to the camera or if we're too far away we also run into problems with rounding errors and also of course it doesn't make sense to model objects that are directly in front of us and also most importantly for for the distance if you think about you have a huge scene like a whole virtual world and then you create an image of it from a certain viewpoint if you go through each objects that are directly in front of you you might need to to go through objects that are so far away that you won't see them in the image anyhow so it's kind of intuitively makes sense that you do not process all objects that are in that direction but that you limit it to a certain kind of a distance which we do mathematically by defining a so-called far plane and for closer than a so-called near plane and with all these uh four uh six planes together we get then something like uh, a cut off pyramid in 3d looks like this and uh, this is called the view frustum and that view frustum contains then all the objects that will be projected onto our 2d screen now for today we will assume that all our objects are within the view frustum later we will see how we deal about with objects that are outside of the view frustum or that are only partly inside the view frustum because we have to treat them in a special way but that's why today we will ignore this case and only assume we have situations like this where the triangles are actually directly inside of the view frustum good so um <clears throat> yeah so what we want now is we want to project those triangles towards the camera position with matrix multiplication now it should be intuitively clear that if the camera would be at the origin that this would be much easier to do mathematically in terms of calculation because for example if it would be at the origin then the gaze vector would be one zero zero which is probably easier to calculate with than a vector like this also the near plane would just be would not be a complex uh, description of a plane it would just be set equals n and the far plane would be set equals f because here we would have then n here we would have f 
and this is then our set axis if this is the origin and then of course the plane equations become quite easy so it should be intuitively clear that this is uh, much easier to deal with but also you know that we already talked about rotation and rotation of coordinate system which is just a simple matrix multiplication so we can actually do that we can just multiply matrix it to the rotation and then have the camera at the origin and then the calculation becomes much easier so if we do that our image looks like that and uh, so today we're, uh, we're the, um, <coughs> We, uh, or for the following, I will assume that we are looking into the negative set axis, and this is the, uh, the uh, x axis, and this is the y axis, and the reason for this is, of course, if you do this, if you think about this, modeling this on a computer screen, that means you have a right-handed uh, coordinate system, where the set axis points out of the screen, so the negatives uh, inside of the screen, it's the negative set axis. Good, so we have this situation here, and we did this to uh, make it, make it, uh, make it uh, simpler. Now the, the, uh, the question is how do we do the, the projection now? So we want to project this towards the camera position. And uh, compared to the orthographic projection, of course the orthographic projection is very simple. If we have an orthographic projection, then we have x, y, and z and we just map that to x and y because the x and y values don't change if we project them in this uh, uh, towards the plane but they do of course change if we project them towards a viewing point so if we have a point x here the point x on the screen and y on the screen are of course different than the points x y and z whereas here x and y on the screen are, uh, are exactly those x and y values that we have here. So this is much easier than, than this one here. The good thing is that also this operation is quite easy. We can, trans we can use matrix multiplication to transform our view frustum to a box that in, and also transform with this matrix multiplication all the objects in the view frustum into this box in a way that preserves the relative size and position of them like they are in the original free frustum. So if we, we can transform the objects in a way that if we do an orthogonal, orthogonal projection here, we get exactly the same image as if we do a perspective projection here. And uh, then of course this projection becomes very easy. So we will learn later how to create this matrix and then we can solve this by doing this transformation and then we call this box here the so-called orthographic view volume. So it has a special name because it's not just a box but it's a box that preserves also the sizes, the relative sizes and positions of the original objects. Good and then Another simplification that we do, and that is just a, a, a step to, to make it simpler, to put the values between minus 1 and 1, which means we move the box to the center, which is just a translation, and then we scale it around this, um, the origin between, so all the values are between minus 1 and 1, this is just a scaling, so you see again translation and scaling just simple matrix multiplication so we can use just a simple matrix multiplication again to make our life easier and then we call this result the canonical view volume and then we still have a 3d box so we want to do the projection but that is easy because it's an orthographic projection so we basically just throw away the set coordinate and then we also have still of course um, uh, one uh, um, a window from minus one to one so we want to map it onto our computer screen which is uh, nx cross y and y so this is just a scaling transformation so again another simple matrix multiplication so we see here we can do all these steps first transfer the or put move the origin to the camera position then do this transformation to this box here where the 
position is, uh, uh, the, the, the sizes and locations of the objects are preserved in a way that it creates the very same image, but in a much, much simpler way, which is then this step where we just do a scale, no, which is, uh, then we do another scaling, and then we have this step, which is then a very simple projection step. It's just throwing away the set coordinate and do a window transformation, a scaling, and then you see all these steps can be done with uh, matrix multiplication. Only this step here is a little more complicated because that doesn't work with what we've learned so far. So we need to extend our matrix multiplication framework here a little bit. But other than that, it's just simple matrix multiplications. And this whole procedure is often called the graphics pipeline. So I hope you remember that we had this in the very first lecture and I said, of course, in graphics, the term graphics pipeline is often used in different contexts. Very often it's used in relation to programming or concrete APIs. Here we use it more as a sort of uh, this to describe the concept, the idea behind it. And uh, you remember probably that uh, a pipeline is characterized by uh, the, uh, the, or the characteristic of a pipeline is that, the, that you have a sequence of steps and each result of one step is the input of the next step. And that's why we call it then a pipeline. And uh, of course, you see here, uh, so, and, and you see here we have single steps and you have a matrix multiplication. Each time the result of the matrix multiplication is the input for the next step, which is the next matrix multiplication. So we have this kind of pipeline sequence here, but you also see here it is only part one of the pipeline because I already said we, for example, we excluded situations where the triangles are or the objects are partly inside of the view frustum. We will also exclude today shading. So we will just deal with grid models today that we're projecting. We will also exclude situations where objects are overlapping. So something like this, we will just exclude for today. We'll just assume that the objects are nicely distributed in our space. And um, <clears throat> so these are the three things that we will cover later that we will exclude for today. Good, and that will then be part two and part three of the pipeline in the following lectures. All right, so um, yeah, like I said, this is the only part where we need to learn something new. So let's start with the easier parts, which is the stuff that we should already know. And of course, probably the most uh, simple part is the last one, which is just a window transformation from the canonical view volume to the screen space. You probably remember, or I hope you remember that in the first tutorial you had, uh, uh, there was a similar question about this. It was about scaling windows, uh, scaling to a window size on the screen. And uh, of course, this is pretty much the same. We're just able to do it with matrix multiplication now. So the situation is we have the canonical view volume, which is a two cross two cross two box. Around, uh, around the origin. And uh, this contains now all our original triangles from the view frustum. So let's try to draw it like this to illustrate that this is a 3D object. Uh, so we have a 3D object in this box, but in the correct size uh, as it would be in the view frustum. And now we want to do an orthographic projection and we want to map it onto our screen image, which has of course a different size. And um, <clears throat> the projection, like I said, is pretty simple. We have x, y, z here, and we project that by just throwing away the z coordinate. So we just project this to x, y, which is then a two-dimensional space. So this here is projected here, so it looks like this, something like this. Okay, so a 2D image basically on the front of the cube and we ignore the third coordinate. That is our projection, of course, pretty simple. Um, but now we're still in a square from minus one, minus one, minus one to one, one, one. Uh, no, minus one, minus one to one, one, 2D now. So we have to do a scaling, which is also quite simple. Um, so assume we have, this is then our screen window with NY, XY and X. And this is from zero to one. And we want to map that to this here. That of course means if it is from zero to one and we want to map it from nx, uh, from zero to nx half, we just have to multiply it with nx half. So each point here 
gets multiplied in x in the x coordinate by n x half, and same in the y coordinate we multiply it by n x half, and that is of course here you see just a simple scaling matrix that we have here. But then we have our screen image around the origin also, like in the original square. But of course we want to have our coordinate system at a corner. So for example, we want to have it here 0, 0. And for example, if this is then uh, like an 800 to 600 window, we want to have it like this. So that means we have to also move the coordinate system here. And if we're in the center, then of course we just move it to here, which means this is of course here n x half, and this here is n y and y half. So you see, we just make a simple translation here, and you remember hopefully that this is the image of the origin under the affine transform transformation, which in this case is just a translation. So we just have these two values here in the coordinate in the in the matrix. These are the homogeneous coordinates, which we need because we do translation, which is an affine transformation, which we cannot do with regular matrix multiplication. So you see a very simple matrix that does this window transformation. One of the things you have to be careful, I usually uh, ignore this here because it just makes the writing, uh, it, it makes it more cluttered and uh, therefore harder to see. But uh, in practice, in the book, you they use this uh, minus one half because you probably remember at the beginning we said that in the hardware, of course, the, the pixel is usually at the center of a cell. So if this is zero and this is one, then of course we have to move it when we are at one, we have to remove one half to be at the center of the pixel, which is why you have then the window is not from zero to ny, but from minus one half to ny minus one half, and also for the x direction. And that of course adds also another minus one in the matrix. Yeah, but this is uh, pretty straightforward. So I will usually assume that, uh, uh, yeah, I, I wrote it down now in the matrices, but uh, yeah, this is then just uh, for the implementation, the details. Good. Um, yeah, so um, this is our matrix, and which is now a 2D matrix because we did the, the projection, of course. But of course, if you want to integrate it later, if you think about the pipeline, we have we said that the pipeline are all steps are single matrices. So we can also combine it and at the end when we have all those single matrices with one matrix. And that means, of course, we have to have four cross four matrices because at the beginning we're dealing with 3D. So we just extend this here with a line in a row in this uh, a row and a column in the, for the set coordinate that doesn't change it and that way we can also then integrate it later with the other matrices the other reason why we want to do that is we want to even if we do not need the the set value to actually draw it on the screen it's good to have it because later when we do it the uh, uh, when we deal about overlapping triangles we need to know the set position of the triangle so we will need this later but for now we just carried along so the, the matrices match. Good. And we do it in a way that uh, with only zeros, with all zeros and only the one at the set coordinate, which basically means we just get a copy of the set coordinate. So it doesn't change, it doesn't influence our our calculation in the other in another way. Good. So we see now that um, this step here from the canonical view volume to the screen space we have a vector, a 3D vector with a fourth coordinate for the homogeneous coordinates. We multiply that, and then we get the x and the y value for the for the uh, for the uh, for the point on the screen. The set value I said we just drag it with us because we don't need it, but we are uh, we don't need it for the for the actual drawing of the point, but we need it later to get the, the distance for overlapping triangles. And of course, we also have then a homogeneous coordinate here, but for the drawing on the screen, we only need the x and the y coordinate. Good. Now, the if we work our way up in the pipeline, the previous step to that would be take the orthographic view volume and get that into the canonical view volume, which is again a simple translation and scaling because the, tra the scaling is clear because the orthographic view volume is defined as an axis parallel box that contains all the objects from the view frustum in the right size and, and the right location. But it is uh, a box, so we just need, so it has 
uh, different length width uh, uh, high and top so we need to scale it to the size of our um, <clears throat> of our a cube from minus one to one and also of course the box is only set to be axis parallel so it can be anywhere so we also have to move it to in a way that the origin is then in the center of our resulting cube. So let's look at this uh, translation first. So let's just look at to, into the first coordinate. We have here left, here we have right, and that means the center of it is of course L plus R divided by 2. So if we want to have the center of the x-axis on the origin, we just have to, uh, the center of the x values on the origin, uh, then we just have to subtract minus L plus R, the, uh, uh, we just have to subtract L plus R divided by 2, which is our first coordinate here, and the same then also of course for the y and the z coordinate, and uh, because it's translation of course we need also this last row here because of the homogeneous coordinates. So then we have it around the origin and then we need to do of course the uh, the scaling and the scaling is again very simple. This here is R minus L so half of it is R minus L divided by 2 and we map that half to 0 and 1 so if you think about of course what do we do when we do the mapping we divide it by the maximum size then we get it scaled between 0 and 1 and dividing by r minus l divided by 2 is the same as multiplication with 2 divided by r minus l so you see here it's just a scaling again a scaling matrix here with all zeros in the lower triangle and zeros in the upper triangle and these are the scaling coefficients for the x-axis it's 2 divided by r minus l for the y and the z-axis we get similar values in the same way good so we see this is just a simple translation and a simple scaling and of course since matrix multiplication is associative we can combine it into one matrix that has then both operations that does both operations in one step and of course because it's associative we can also combine this matrix multiplication with the the following one that we created earlier so we have the orthographic projection and now we also have the transformation from the orthographic view volume to the canonical view volume but remember we also have to remember that matrix multiplication is not commutative so we have to be careful that we preserve the right order actually I said it exactly wrong so uh, yeah uh, this this on the right here is of course this matrix here one that's this matrix and that's two I explained it the other way around because we're working our way from the bottom up the pipeline but of course if we apply it to the original vector we go from the top which means we have to apply the matrices in this order good all right and um, yeah, and the next step, if we work from the bottom up, would be exactly this one, which I said is the little more complicated step, which is why I want to skip it now and first talk about this transformation here, which is the transformation from the world space to the camera space. And I uh, remember the motivation for this was that we said it is much easier to do the calculation, of course, if the camera is placed at the origin of our coordinate system. So what we do here is we basically transform, take all the coordinates from world space representation to camera space representation. And we already defined our spaces by, in a world space, by the coordinates uh, axis or the three base vectors, x, y, and z and uh, the camera space we define by the i vector e and the gaze vector g but of course you see here we only have now we can describe our camera by this but we don't have this coordinate system so these other two vectors that are here shown in the image that we want to map onto the world space 
or where we want to wrap the world space onto are still missing. But we already know how to create this because we had this in relation to a rotation of an object around a random line or a random vector. We can just do it by using the cross product. In the previous case, we used. Uh, yeah, you have a question? Did you say cross product only objects or uh, the random? Yeah, the I'm just about to say this. Yeah. The. Uh, <coughs> the uh, in the previous case, we used a random vector to create a cross product, and that would, of course, result in a random thing, yeah. But here we want to have, of course, our coordinate system in line with the projected image, which is why we define a so-called view up vector t, which is defined as any vector that is not parallel to our gaze vector, but is on the line that splits basically my viewpoint in half. So if this is my viewpoint, then I draw a, li uh, a plane straight and it splits it in two halves. And that line is of course then perpendicular to the viewing space, uh, the viewing plane. And so this is a plane here. And that way, of course, if we do then, if we have this view of vector T, then, if we do a cross product of t with g, we get a vector v that is perpendicular to that plane, which means it is in the same direction as the, as the viewing plane. And then, of course, we get this other vector here. So this is our vector v. And then we get this other vector, let's call it uh, w by multiplying g with v and then we just set g to u and then we have our v, w, v and u coordinate system and of course we also have to multiply that or divide by the, each vector by its length to do a normalization to have an orthogonal coordinate system and we will see later why this is important or if we do that it will make our life much simpler later. Good. So now we have the coordinate system, now we have to map or align those two coordinate systems with each other and um, we do this, again we can split it in simpler steps. First of all we can say we just align the origins and then we align the base vectors and then we have aligned all the whole coordinate system. So the first step, the aligning of the origins, is again a simple translation. We already have the i vector, now if we want to map the, the world coordinate system to the camera coordinate system, we just have to subtract that. So remember again this is the image of the origin under the translation after the transfine and sli translation. So we just subtract the i vector here. That gives us this right image. And then the next step will be, of course, to map those, to align those coordinates uh, axes with each other. And from the image, you see that this is just a simple rotation around an angle here in that direction, because both of them here have a right angle. So if we rotate everything by the right angle, then they should map. Um, Actually, that was wrong. I was rotating in that direction, of course. Now, <coughs> the reason why I made it, made it wrong is, of course, uh, we don't have that angle. But if you remember, the uh, or, or the question is, how do we get the, the rotation matrix? Um, and uh, if you remember, the columns of this matrix are the images of the base vector under the linear transformation. And in that direction, this is, might not be that obvious, but in this direction, if we rotate in the other direction, this is very obvious because then the image vectors of the base vectors are exactly the vectors u, v, and uh, w pointing out, which means we just have right, can write them as the column vectors here, u, v, and w. But, of course, this is the opposite, so the inverse of the transformation that we want. So the transformation that we want is actually the inverse of that matrix. And here it comes in very handy that we have an ortho, uh, ortho, ortho, uh, 
orthogonal uh, coordinate system because we learned also previously, I think it was a, a, even an exercise on the tutorials, that the inverse of an orthogonal matrix is always its transpose. So we just have to write u, v, and w in the lines here, and that is then our rotation matrix that does exactly this rotation that we have here in the image. So if you put both together, the translation and the rotation, we get this matrix here, and if we then put everything together, so this is again uh, one, two, and we skipped that step here, so that means this is our third one, uh, <laughs> three, two, one, because we start from the top, of course, but I explain it bottom way up, so here this is our order, and when we can combine this and then just have it. Now, if we would not want to do a perspective projection, just an orthogonal projection, we would be done. Because this transforms the camera space, then we do the scaling to the canonical view volume, and then we do the orthogonal projection and the scaling on the screen space. So this gives us an orthogonal projection. The only thing that is missing now is a perspective projection. And because it takes longer to explain that, I will uh, we'll make an earlier break and we meet then uh, five minutes also earlier. But first, the question, yeah.